Um, I'm a professional counselling psychologist in the UK and um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, some of the um, uh, psychology related um, material uh, around COVID that can help you with anxiety and um, share some clinical experiences as well um, and some tips that um, my patients and my clients are using. Um, and we're going to make this a little bit uh, interactive. So um, the main concerns that people are talking about at the moment, I've, I always find it really helpful when you're looking at things that are worrying to categorize them. And um, I think that can help when everything's feeling a bit overwhelming. And so there are three main categories that people are talking to me about at the moment. The first is concerns that are directly related to the virus. So getting ill as a, as a carer, your the person you're caring for getting ill and then being especially vulnerable and um, whether they are going to um, be more at risk of not surviving if they get the virus and if you are more at risk of not surviving. So all of those kind of medical concerns. The second category is how the virus can impact on your usual medical a journey that you're on with the person that you care for. So a lot of people in the UK are getting uh, health appointments cancelled, um, they're having their treatment delayed, and even if they're not being delayed, they're worried about going to their usual hospital um, and picking up infection. So all of the kind of normal pathway you're on in terms of treatment and seeing doctors and that sort of thing is kind of being affected indirectly. Um, by the by the virus and by the risks of going to hospital and then the third category is kind of more broad it's it's around the consequences of the pandemic so the, just the shutting down of normal life in lots of ways and a lot of things we take for granted living in lockdown I'm not exactly sure of the situation in Canada whether you're all in lockdown but certainly in the UK at the moment, we're all in lockdown, regardless of our vulnerability. It's not just the people who are most ill. And we're only allowed to go out for certain um, predefined means like medical medical appointments and, and, and shop. So, so what I'm, what I'm going to, uh, the reason I said those three categories is I think it's really helpful to try and work out if you are feeling anxious at the moment, which of those is the ones that's causing you most anxiety. So it might sound counterintuitive if you're feeling anxious to think about the anxiety. But actually, there's loads of evidence to say that if you can be specific about what you're worried about, you're more likely to be able to look at treatment and look at what can be done for that anxiety than it being this sort of nebulous, massive kind of undefined anxiety. So that's the first question I would, I would ask you to think about when you say this is a really stressful time or I'm really worried at the moment, what exactly are you worried about for you and the person that you're caring about? Now, the next thing I want to say is that regardless of what your anxiety is, keeping emotionally healthy will help you and there is a lot of evidence there's a lot of scientific evidence about how if we can control our emotional health and make it as strong as we can then we can we, our anxiety scores we can measure, measure anxiety so it's almost a bit like a preventative medicine approach that actually if we can do good things for our emotional health we actually end up treating the anxiety when it when it pops up and we've got a, a, an institute in the UK, which is grounded in, in psychological science called the Human Givens uh, Institute, the Human Givens Foundation. And I'm going to use their framework for my talk today because they, they, they just sum it up really nicely. And they say that there are, there are several things that are really important for our emotional health. So number one is the need for security and control. Number two is the need to relate to others for intimacy and att attention and feeling connected. Number three is the need for privacy and time alone to be calm and reflect and just be with ourselves. And number four is the need for achievement to have some meaning, some purpose, including having a sense of common purpose with, with others, with our community. Now, I really like these categories because they make a lot of sense for me in terms of the sort of things that help people in my clinical practice. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk through each of those and I'm going to say why it's important. And I'm just going to give you some ideas about what people do to help themselves with these categories. 
So the first one was the need for security and control. Now, this is a massive issue at the moment because a lot of people are saying things like, I feel totally overwhelmed. Everything feels out of control. It feels that there's nothing I can do about this. It all feels too big. And this can really tap into our need to have control. I did talk last time uh, in relationships about the importance of understanding the difference between what's within your control and what's outside your control. And it has never been more important than in the current pandemic. So if we can focus on the bits we can control, it has positive psychological effect because we can do something about it. Now, I don't know if it's true in Canada, but there's a lot of scaremongering about in the UK on social media, um, some of the worst kind of news sites and things like that. And I think there is a lot of temptation at the moment to think that this is just, you know, the end of life as we know it permanently. And it is very scary. And therefore, kind of pulling back from that and focusing on what we control has never been more important. I just want to ask the question about whether anyone has got any thoughts straight off about things at the moment that you can keep control of, even while everything else is out of your control. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? So, so that's, that's a very good, it's written about in the psychological literature as well. You know, when people like lose their jobs and things like this, actually trying to have a routine and a structure, which you have to self-impose because you don't have a job to go to, is really, really useful. And it can, it can help you to have that sense of mastery, that sense of control. No. Anyone, anyone else got any thoughts on that? That's, that's really, really lovely. And actually, you tick two boxes there, Key, because you're not only focusing on devotions, but you're doing the outreach as well to others who can benefit from that, which is the, the need for community and connection. So you're ticking yes. both boxes. Really, really great. OK, I'm just going to give you some examples from my clinical practice. Um, so some of these may, may be things that you're doing already, or some of these might be good ideas. So one of the things that can be really helpful is to remind yourself maybe even write a list of all the things that you are doing to help the current situation so it might be that you know you've got really extra good hand hygiene at home and you're being really careful of that you're keeping really on top of cleaning and kind of keeping the environment safe when you get shopping delivered or if you're going out and getting shopping you're cleaning things when they come back from the shops so you're doing those things to keep yourself physically healthy and to keep the person that you're caring for physically healthy so making a list and identifying those things that you're already doing that's really helpful the second example um, i call them mantras um, so sometimes people from different religious and belief systems may call them different things uh, devotions or prayers but even people with no kind of religious um, uh, grounding can use a mantra so a few words that can be really inspirational and helpful to you now I have a client who puts these on her on her fridge on her on her bathroom mirror when she's brushing her teeth you know in her bed in her book by her bed that she reads every night and I just got a couple of examples of, of the sort of things that, that you can use uh, what I really like is I do enough I have enough I am enough I do enough, I have enough, I am enough. I just feel calmer when I hear that. You know, it's, re it's, really, it's really nice. Another one is I'm doing the best I can in difficult times. I'm doing the best I can in difficult times. Um, a, very, uh, a very commonly used one is this too shall pass. This too shall pass. It doesn't matter which ones you use. There's loads of them you can find online if you don't want to make up your own. But find some that speak to you. Share them with family and friends, but use them in your daily life. Um, I was going to talk about imposing a structure and a routine. Ben has covered that, so I won't go into that. Um, where shall I go next? Appreciations. So appreciations are something that you can do very personally for yourself but also if you if you can engage the person you're caring for in this it can be really nice so i have a number of families where what they do before they go to bed at night is they just say a couple of things to each other that they've appreciated during the day 
and it may be really small at the moment it might be hey we heard the bird singing on the bird table in the garden when we opened the window or actually wasn't it really lovely that we we managed to make a an amazing dinner out of our store cupboard ingredients because we haven't been able to go to the shop or is it that you know we've got a really lovely warm bed and we can kind of cuddle up and be warm of an evening um, a decent cup of coffee, you know, appreciate the small things, which is, you know, something that people are talking about at the moment that could come out of this. But actually make a point of saying to each other, if you can get your loved one involved in this, to do a couple of affirmations. There is lots of evidence that ending the day with a positive can mean you sleep better and you have a better night. So you start the next day in a better place. If your partner or the person you care for isn't up for this, then think about having a little notebook by the side of your bed. I have a client who has been writing two or three affirmations a day for several months. And then on a bad day, she's got a lovely resource to look back through of all the things that she's appreciated. Um, just the final example I wanted to give you is don't overexpose yourself to things that are going to make you feel more out of control. So 24 seven news, probably not a good idea. Um, a lot of people are choosing which news source they want to use. So, you know, we've got the uh, BBC in the UK, you know, you may have a, a broadcaster in Canada that you feel you trust. And if not a government website or a health based website that you have more confidence in rather than kind of other things that are going to be scaremongering and limit the amount of access say well i'm going to check first thing in the morning in case anything's happened overnight and i'm going to check at tea time and that's it i'm not going to allow myself to be exposed too much that's one of the ways that we can control how much of the outside stuff is coming into our heads and into our hearts okay i'm going to move on to the second one which is about need to relate to others and be in community as well what thoughts have you got about how you can keep connected to the wider community? That, that's lovely. I mean, I heard somebody say the other day that actually it's, it's a good excuse to be able to connect to people that maybe you haven't connected to for a while because you can look people up now and say, hey, I just was wondering how you were doing. Um, and yeah, we can phone them, we can, we can video call them, we can use text, we can email, we've, we've got all those, those access to all those things. Um, I've even started sending little postcards and little cards that I've got around the house to people, just things that can make people smile. Because I don't know about you, but I don't get many things that are handwritten in the post anymore. You know, it's bills and circulars and things like that. It's so nice when you get an envelope that's handwritten. You know, so that's a gift you can give to, to family and friends and dig out those notelets you've got in the bottom drawer and, you know, connect that way. I mean, in a way, I'm preaching to the converted here, guys, because you're already, do, you're already on this forum and you're already doing things like this, which is really lovely. And I, I don't know about you, but, you know, there is a lot of groups in the UK now that are getting together for things that you would normally do face to face. So um, singing you know, choirs that have gone online and you've got people so sitting here like this and they're doing their choir practice. Um, I went to a meditation group online the other day and we did a silent meditation. Now that kind of seems weird, doesn't it? How I'm being silent, but I'm being with you. But actually the sense of connection and intimacy where we were all doing the same thing in community with each other, it was really lovely. And, you know, I was a bit skeptical about this, but, you know, it was, it was good. It was bonding. Um, I just want to give you another example, which is that, you know, I know that you are, your life may be full of lot, doing a lot of carers and um, caring tasks for people. Um, but um, I have got a number of family carers who are actually doing voluntary work and caring for non-family members and doing outreach as a result of this pandemic. So even if you are stuck in your own home, you may find that there's charities that are involved and um, they're doing things like calling vulnerable people who literally have nobody and they have rotors for, you know, just making a little touch and base call with people. Um, or a rotor for kind of going and getting a couple of things of extra shopping for, for an elderly neighbor or something because you're going out and doing shopping for your family and things like that. So, 
I, I even I even heard the other day about a family carer who was sewing face masks. You know the kind of fabric masks that you can you can get. They were sewing those, even though they're really busy. That might not be the right thing for you. It it so mm. might not be. But yeah. think about. We know that actually one really important thing for our mental health is if we can be supportive of other people, and get outside our own head and our own problems. It can really help our mental health. So um, just final example is um, lots of people are struggling with homeschooling their children in the UK. And I guess that's also an issue over there. And, you know, grandparents just doing a little bit of online with the children just to give the parents a bit of downtime and things like that. Um, you know, just doing 20 minutes with, you know, kids on, online, you know, it's not much out of our day, but yeah. Okay. Um, just the final thing on working together is acknowledge that you and the person that you care for may be coping really differently with this. So we talked quite a lot about differences in the psychology when, when I did my, my talk for you on relationships. But just I would just urge you to try and, try and teach each other with a bit of kindness. You know, you may be really anxious. They may have their head in the sun. And you might find that you're bickering about things that you wouldn't normally bicker about, like boiling over boiling the potatoes or something and of course it's not really about that you know our, our psychology doesn't work like that our you know we transfer our anxiety onto manageable things so often when things are too big we get really stressed about the day-to-day -day stuff so just just treat each other with a bit of compassion um so the third one was about um time privacy and time alone and t time to be calm and time to reflect now you might find that you know, because you're not seeing everybody in the normal way, that actually you've got, you know, quite a lot of that. Um, but actually, you may still feel that your, you know, your caring duties are the same as they always were. So you, you know, you, you maybe aren't feeling that you have got all this extra time. Somebody said to me the other day that there's a lot of um, a pressure on, you know, you should be doing amazing things like learning Japanese in your spare time when you're in lockdown. And actually, a lot of people are just their normal day to day routine is carrying on like normal. It's just within the house. So, you know, don't put yourself under pressure to learn Japanese. You know, you haven't got time. You haven't got you haven't got time. But I would really encourage you to think about how you can take a certain amount of time out every day and that be really part of your self care. So in my last talk, we talked, I gave you an example of somebody who had a golden hour, which is when her relative was asleep in the evening. Um, and somebody said to me the other day, it's a little bit like, you know, when, um, when, you're, when you've got a baby and the, the mother sleeps when the baby sleeps because she has to, she has to grab that time. I really want to encourage you to grab that time and to use that time for things that are good for you. And that doesn't mean keeping up with the ironing. That means actually doing some things which are good for your self-care. So one of the things I'd like to encourage you to do is the 15 minute challenge. And the 15 minute challenge basically just asks you, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you now, but you might not have any idea, so you can think about it afterwards. If you have 15 minutes where you have not got to do a job, what can you do within your own house which is gonna make you feel better, calmer, happier, recharged, good? It's a very personal thing, you know, um, you've got to find what is your 15 minute thing and maybe come up with a few of them. But if you've never thought like that, because you're always so busy and you just do the ironing and do the jobs, um, I really want to encourage you to think about that. Um, and the final section, because I know, I know we're really pushed for time, is just to talk about need for achievement, meaning and purpose and the sense of community. So this, this, this is really, really crucial that we, we need to feel that we, can, we, are, we are doing something with our day that, it, that is useful and that we're part of something bigger and this this can really 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 help us um but sometimes if we're not as linked to our community because we're self-isolating then you can kind of lose sight of that so i think one of the things that that can really help is to think about your own resourcefulness and resilience that you have as a family carer because i've got a theory which is that because you are used to dealing with things that most people would find really difficult, you might in some way have skills that can help you to cope better in this crisis than somebody who's had a charmed life and who doesn't have the difficulties that you have. 
the, 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 the other example I wanted to give you about meaning and purpose is that actually, you know, we could get very existential here about what is the meaning of life and this sort of thing. And don't worry, I'm not going to do that today. But <laughs> I do think that sometimes simplicity is important and you can have like grand, um, grand um, passions and things that, you know, you, you, you dedicate yourself to. But actually, sometimes also the small things really matter. So I mentioned listening to the birds in the trees and things like that. Sometimes just being able to realize that you're doing the best you can with the person that you love, the relative that you're caring for. You know, it's really difficult at the moment, but you're just doing something amazing just by being a family carer. And just just go back to that appreciating of your of yourself and distract yourself sometimes from the enormity of all of this difficult stuff because you know distraction can sometimes be seen as as a bit of a dirty word you know that i shouldn't i shouldn't immerse myself in some trashy soap opera or read some magazine or you know bake a cake or whatever but actually i think what we're realizing in covid is that sometimes those small things are actually really really important you know go and watch a, a trashy film tonight and just enjoy it for its own sake everything doesn't have to be deep and meaningful and if you think everything Everything does it's not going to be good for your mental health you know so distract yourself do something really silly it's kind of part of psychological theory this idea of, of self-soothing um, so self-soothing is, is, is similar to what we do with a baby when a baby is upset we soothe them we rock them we hold them and we're not very good at soothing ourselves but if you know what soothes you and, you know, I have got, I'm, I'm an intellectual academic person, and yet I read the most trashy rubbish novels and things like that. That soothes me. That soothes me to get away from, from, from hard, difficult clinical work and actually get into trivia. So I would encourage you to get into trivia as part of your self-care, as part of your emotional health. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to um, wrap up because I know I'm way over, uh, over time as, as usual. I talk too much. Um, what I'm going to say is I'll send you some questions. I'll send Jenna some questions, which are the questions I've covered today, which I would really encourage you to, to have a think about and use your self-knowledge to work out your own strategies for how to cope emotionally through this. But really, really believe that you have the resourcefulness and resilience to do this, because if I know anything about family carers, I know that you are the guys who, who will get through this. And it's really hard and it's really difficult, but you could do a lot through community together to to support each other through through. I think yeah, I've got I've I've got that situation with quite a number of uh, people that I work with. I think the first thing I would say is not to personalise it. So it doesn't have to be you having the battle with them. I would be su suggesting that they look at the 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 best government website advice and you know be sending them the links if you need to, saying this is not just me being difficult. This is absolutely what I have to do because of the condition that 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 they have. Um, so give the information because it stops it being between you and them. I mean this. Is is what the government's saying this is what the health provider is saying um, I also think a little bit of kind of emotional pressure can also be useful that we are doing this self-isolating because we love them and we want them to stay well and the best way you can love us is to follow this so yeah. actually kind of appealing to that kind of emotional side of it I know you want to see him or her whoever it is because you love them but actually the best thing is to not Another tip I think is useful is to think about how they can keep connected, but they may not have thought of this. So if you can help them with some of these ideas of, you know, it really isn't good for us to get together as a family at the weekend, but hey, how about we have a, a, a Sunday Skype call where we all get together and we instigate that, you know, because we want to keep connection with you. So if you can help your family to think of alternatives, Mm -hmm. for some of the things that we've talked about today i know a lot of them um, i know a lot of families in this country used to have a regular sunday lunch um, thing we're getting together so they have sunday lunch calls um i went to a social event last night which was like a friday night thing <laughs> that was a zoom party you know so suggest this as being you know the, the best alternative but i i, I really would encourage the, the person in your community to hold firm 
because they are the main I assume they're the main family carer of, of the person with with the cancer and so they you know they they must be able to hold that boundary and the worst scenario is that somebody is a bit upset with them but actually they know that they're doing the right thing they're doing the most loving thing in being strict about the, the guidance that you're following and okay somebody's a bit upset about it but that is so much better than the relative <laughs> getting ill and the consequences yeah. of that 